Hey everyone, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 556, being recorded Wednesday, September 4th, 2019. I'm your host, Jim Tannis, and let me unmute your co-hosts. Go ahead, guys. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Ryan Shrout. No, he's not. Ryan, no. Ryan no, has uh, Ryan's eyes are far deader than yours. I'm I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. <laughs> It's like well, a great white shark swinging in a marketing uh, Sebastian marketplace. Sebastian Peak, but Jeremy is not with us just for this week. Uh, he has some stuff to take care of, so it's just the three of us you've got, and we've got a big show because we missed last week, so we've got a ton of reviews, a ton of news, and so we're just going to uh, jump right into it. If you want the usual housekeeping stuff, listen to a different episode. We talk about that. Well, at the I'm really episode. bad at the housekeeping stuff, so maybe go back to the last time that Jim hosted to get all of that You know stuff. what? At least do Patreon because I like to get paid. Okay, well, sure. Uh, so we do, uh, you know, uh, winter's we, coming. I need to pay gas bills. Okay, we have a Patreon at patreoncom pcpro which helps us out at the site here. Every penny you, you donate there goes directly to operating the site. So uh, check that out, patreoncom pcpro And if we, uh, if you increase your pledge or become a new donor during this live stream here on this Wednesday night, I'll get an email. I'll read your name, or if you edit your name field before making the pledge, I'll read what you put in that name field. So that's our fun little thing we get to encourage embarrassment and uh, and pledges. So uh, check that out, patreon.com slash PC part. But let's, uh, let's jump right into the show. Uh, so as we said, a ton of reviews because we missed last week. First, we're, we're kicking things off with Sebastian, who took a look at Ryzen 5 3600X Gaming to uh to see mostly, you know yeah, what's gaming. what's the story with this product uh, as a gaming processor well if you're just comparing it to the other Ryzen 3000 processors which is primarily what I wanted to do because I uh, to this point I had only tested the 3700X and the 3900X with the launch review they sent this 3600X along later and I finally got to it there's a couple of things going on here first just where does this sit in relation to the others as far as just pure gaming performance goes? Is this going to be the, the bottleneck with the same exact GPU, same system, same operating system? And really what you will find if you check out the review and look at the gaming results is that it is not. It's You're within a frame or two of the big brothers in the family. Certain games that are more CPU not CPU bound, but like uh, more balanced with their like CPU GPU usage, you will see a little bit more of a difference because you just have fewer cores and threads with this. You're talking about six cores and 12 threads versus the 3700X, which has eight and eight. And then of course the 3900X has 12 and 24. But like Shadow of the Tomb Raider is the one we're looking at if you're watching the video right now and you're talking like 3600X was at 111 frames per second. And, you know, the, the highest FPS numbers on the chart are 115. So you're all within about three or four frames per second of each other. It was consistently much faster than the Ryzen 5 2600X. So, I mean, it's, it's a massive jump over a 2600X. It's even a jump over a 2700X in certain instances. Not when, of course, the extra cores and threads are at play. But... When we move past gaming, so like the long and short of it with gaming is, you know, if you're just buying a Ryzen processor for gaming, you don't need to buy the most expensive parts. In fact, you probably don't even need the 3600X. Just grab the 3600 because that's the current low-end model, still six cores, 12 threads, great gaming part for 199 Moving on to CPU results, I actually started playing with the Agisa Code updates. The absolute newest, as of right now, I think, is 1.0.0.3ABB. There was temporarily an ABA that apparently was not stable or had some issue and was pulled. I was using AB, which is, I think, the first or second combo update that's come out since the launch. So recent, anyway. And the... You will notice, depending on the benchmarks, the biggest disparity was with the X264 benchmark. You lose performance. In fact, you lost 10 frames per second on the first pass of the X264 benchmark on average over the course of four runs that I averaged here. 
And that's significant. I mean, it was, it really depends on the benchmark. It depends on what you're doing, but you're, you're seeing a noticeable drop. And I made a couple of little graphics here to show I was doing some CPU logging in the background when I was running Cinebench and with 1.0.0.3 AB, this CPU is capped at 1.44 volts. It never went above that. And on the original pre-launch BIOS for the same motherboard with the original, like the first Agisa version that supported these processors, it was spiking almost all the way up to 1.5 at times, like 1.48 was common and above. And you see that at idle, you see that under load. And with dot three AB, it was absolutely capped at 1.44. So with that, you get slightly lower boost frequencies, you get slightly lower performance. So it, it I don't know if this is simply because they're worried about longevity with these seven nanometer parts. And over the course of time and their testing, they've decided to kind of cap what they are capable of hitting as far as voltages go. I don't know, Josh, what do you think about this? Uh, is is it reasonable for them to kind of look at it and say like a safe operating voltage for this particular part is blank and that gets baked in as just a microcode update for your motherboard or do you th I mean, how do you feel about that and how do you feel about the fact that this happened after launch and after all the launch reviews have been out? Yeah, I, I think that AMD needed to get their marketing on the same page as engineering a little bit sooner. Um, but you know, you know, optimism is something that you know you feel when you release product that you have you know a lot of optimism for. But you're you're probably over over optimistic about how it can perform and things it can do, and especially the engineers and the guys who are doing this are like, yeah, you know, these are some early samples. Mm, I can see us. You know, going to this far and, and and being able to boost it up to this much, and then, you know, we we have uh, ways of measuring TDP that that the average user does not have, and and we can see things, and it looks fine. But yeah, I mean, you you could be right. I mean, they could be getting some of these production wafers off the line back in February, and saying, okay, they're working, and they're working now at this, and we're working them through June, July, and at the beginning of August we're seeing some kind of strange things that maybe we ought to pull back a bit on how aggressive uh, we're clocking and, and applying voltage to these things. And then I mean, we don't have any of this information from AMD. Obviously it's, it's confidential. It's stuff that not talking about, but I mean, they, they do have this, you know, more extreme testing in the back end that they, you know, try to make sure that, hey, the, these clocks and the voltages and, and, and the usage we're, we're aiming this at, you know, we can, we can support these, you know, for three to five years, if not longer. And maybe they're just hitting a spot where it's not looking that way. And again, it's, you know, we're still early in seven nanometer. We haven't had the seven nanometer plus stuff out. Uh, design rules are still kind of changing, though. I mean, they're they're mostly solid, but we're still. This is the first really major seven nanometer part from a manufacturer that 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 goes to the higher TDPs. We have some other mobile parts that are you know less than five watts for you know cell phones and whatnot, and then we got the the five to twenty five watt range, and and sixty five is not you know too bad, but once you're getting ninety five watts and above. Then you know maybe we're we're seeing some degradation of uh, of of the of the actual silicon uh, with some of these voltages, and you know that obviously would be concerning. Um, you know, there's a lot more questions that we need to ask, and a lot more that needs to be provided to us with these questions. And I think eventually AMD is going to get there, but I don't know when, and I don't know if we're going to like the answers necessarily, but. Having said that, I bought a 3600X some months ago, and I've enjoyed the experience in the test machine that I have because it's, it is quick in pretty much everything. You've got six cores, 12 threads, and gaming-wise, it's, it's such an improvement from the 2600X, which was my previous favorite CPU, 
that it's a nice upgrade from there. And uh, plus, you know, as of right now, and you got to be careful with this. If you've got an X470 board, more than likely it's, if you have not updated its BIOS to the very latest, and I don't know, when is the BIOS that is going to cut off PCI 4.0 capabilities? Do you, is that They're out yet? Out. Or yeah. Is it? For, for the Gigabyte board I've been using, which is the Gigabyte Aorus Gaming 7, the F41 BIOS was the last one that preserved PCIe 4. Anything beyond that removes PCI Express 4.0 support. Yeah, so, so you and, need to be careful with that because I've got an MSI Gaming M7, and it's a great board, and it runs perfectly fine at PCI 4.0 speeds. I've got the, uh, I've got that. Uh, oh, it starts with an S. The PCI 4.0, not Serrano. Sabrent. Um, Sabrent. Sa- Sabrent or whatever. Sa- yeah. It's it's running in there at PCI 4.0 speeds and it's just doing great and it's fantastic. Here, here's the, so I, here's I doubt. the problem with that because AMD is kind of bullying these manufacturers at this point, honestly, because these are GSA code updates that are coming down, which are addressing not just they're not just capping voltage on these CPUs and, and adjusting performance slightly, as we've seen. They're doing things like removing PCI Express 4.0, but also for some of these motherboards, especially if you're on X570, you might be waiting for that next BIOS update that's going to enhance memory support and compatibility and let you run at those higher speeds. I I had a lot of trouble on that first AGISA version on those pre-launch BIOS revisions on these motherboards getting things like 3600. On X570s or X470s? X570. I had far less issue with X470 than I did with X570, but it was a more mature platform, and I had memory that I knew worked on the platform. Going to X570, I was struggling getting things like XMP memory running without... You had to go through and do everything manually, and there were multiple reboots, and I would have system crashes and instability. So if you if you have those kinds of issues and you're, you update your BIOS to alleviate those and then in the process i i guess i keep thinking that it's going to take away something that people might find useful like as you said you're running pcie 4 as long as people aren't having issues on their older platform boards i guess it's not as much of a problem it's just yeah i mean if, if you've got an x470 don't update past early august bios dates just just don't because it's still going to be running faster and you're going to have PCI 4.0 support. And um, think about but it. You're going to lose out on the boost clock. No, you're not. You're, you're going to gain because they've retarded it in the last couple of Aegis's. Well, well, that's true. Yeah. If you, if you run... an update, doesn't it? You, I have actually, I, did, I wondered if it's you could trade off. I wondered if you could downgrade successfully and apparently you can. So as long as it's not one of those lovely boards that features the inability to downgrade to an older BIOS revision, then I guess you could... I don't know. It, I mean, if it works, just keep it and don't worry s- about it. But we live in the age of security updates, Josh. What happens when... Yeah, but a BIOS some... is not going to do a whole lot there. And also, yeah, I, I know exactly Tell how you feel. Tell that to people who not... point to Intel results and say that we're not running on a new enough BIOS version because of all the security mitigations that are actually in microcode. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. I, I, I hear you screaming. But I'm just saying that the, the hardest part for me is is seeing a new BIOS posted and saying, I can't Let's just give it a that. shot. I can't, I can't do it. This is killing me on the inside because I've got to have the latest and greatest, even though it's not the greatest. But anyway, uh, my experience is 3600X were very good on the X470 with a BIOS that was uh, late July. And let's just maybe leave it at that. Let's take a, a break here to welcome Jeremy. Uh, he was able to make it. So, so hello, Jeremy. But also, can you adjust your mic? It is way too hot. Uh, that's, that's Apart good. from that's Sebastian's good. Uh, attacking some I sort had of a, I, had a, I had a small fit. Sorry. Awesome. All right, cool. You know, we can talk about this all night, but let's talk about something inoffensive, like, you know, comparing Intel to AMD laptops. Yeah, this is what controversial. Could, what, 
yeah, what could possibly result other than accolades and pleasure from the community? Indeed. So what Sebastian's talking about, of course, is Ice Lake, the long-awaited mass-produced, not technically the first, but the first, like, broadly available 10 nanometer CPU from Intel. They've been teasing it forever. Uh, it finally launched, uh, I think, the Dell XPS 13 2-in-1, which is what we got to test, was the very first system to launch. It launched over this past weekend, and now they're at the uh, the uh, IFA or IFA, however you pronounce that, the, the, the big trade show in Germany, and they're announcing additional models from other companies coming out with Ice Lake processors in the next uh, few weeks. But we got a chance to take a look at this Dell XPS uh, 2-in-1. It's got the i7-1065 G7, uh, which is a uh, it's it's a 15 watt uh, base TDP uh, quad core eight threaded part. The 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 whole thing with uh, with uh, Ice Lake is that the as a ten as a ten nanometer part and with Intel having a difficulty having such difficulty getting to ten nanometers, the clocks are much lower than their fourteen nanometer predecessors. But they made up for that with an up to eighteen or I guess an average of eighteen percent IPC increase. Uh, for the Sunny Cove architecture, which makes up this Ice Lake uh, part. And, and so on the processor side, you're looking at good performance, but not perhaps as much as you'd expect from a three-year kind of wait, basically, between major architecture shifts. And and so that's that's the one side of it. And then looking at the other side, you've got graphics. And this is really where the more exciting part is. And this is what guys like Ryan have been working on over at Intel. And this is their new Iris Plus. Well, so... Intel calls it the Iris Plus graphics for their top-end uh, Ice Lake processors, but that name has already been used in the past, and so I'm not quite sure about this. I'm calling it the Iris Plus G series because that is the processor designation. It's the, the G7 and the G5 denote the various levels of graphics performance. So that's really where the, the, uh, the advancements come with this generation. And you've got, Intel has promised, we've talked about this before, uh, double the performance over Whiskey Lake in, in many areas of gaming and, and other GPU-focused task, uh, tasks, but also uh, reaching parity, if not exceeding, AMD in that APU space, which AMD has just owned for years. And so we, we wanted to test this out with this initial Ice Lake system, so we put it up against a system running an AMD Ryzen 7 3700U. Now... Uh, we do want to also point out too, Ryzen 3000 for mobile is not what you may have heard about with Ryzen 3000 for desktop and then the equivalent uh, parts that are going into servers that came out in the last few months, which are very exciting. Although obviously, as we just talked about, it may have some issues, but those are those are different. Ryzen 3000 on the desktop is Zen 2. Ryzen 3000 for mobile launched last year at CES and is based on Zen Plus. So this is basically a year-old technology from AMD going up against the literal bleeding edge from Intel. And so uh, how does it perform? What's what's the, the comparison? And so we, we ran through a bunch of benchmarks. And not surprising on the CPU side, Intel maintains its advantage significantly in some cases. You know, Cinebench here, it's got a, a, a pretty good lead in, in both uh, uh, the single and multi-core uh, tests. Uh, we tested Cinebench R15 as well, just to kind of look at the older older tests. Same basic trend there. Uh, for Geekbench, you've got, uh, again, huge leads, double uh, the score in some categories. Uh, things catch up a little bit in uh, the, in the single core. That first chart was multi-core. But let's, let's you know, jump past this. If you want to read all these graphs, we have the full article uh, at uh, PC Per. But let's get to the uh, gaming benchmarks, because like I said, that's really where the exciting stuff is. So here's here's kind of a first one, which is the Final Fantasy 15, I'm sorry, Final Fantasy 14, uh, XIV, 14, Shadowbringers, uh, which is their, uh, the benchmark for the latest version of that Final Fantasy 14 online game. And again, the XPS with its Iris Plus does beat out the AMD 3700U with its Vega 10, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not as, as much of a difference as we saw in some of the CPU tests. Uh, looking at actual games, you've got Civilization here where the, the Ryzen does win significantly in, uh, in some areas. Uh, here we've got Intel winning in the F1 uh, 720p test, I believe also significantly more in the 1080p, although F1 is a, F1's pushing it for playable and with these integrated graphics, but still uh, Intel is o over 30 frames per second, if that matters to you. Far Cry 5, Intel wins again uh, by a little bit. 
Uh, Grand Theft Auto V, a uh, pretty significant win for uh, for Intel. The uh, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege is is a win pretty much for AMD, although it's it's close. And uh, so that was uh, on the low settings for uh, Rainbow Six, and at uh, medium settings, again, AMD is winning and and does widen the margin in a few of those those areas. Rocket League again, another big win for AMD, although again, Intel's playable. This is Rocket League at the high quality again. AMD's ahead. World of Warships, which I know Josh likes, uh, looks like, uh, again, AMD's overall uh, just eking out a victory here, although, again, Intel is playable on low at 1080p, and at medium, again, pretty pretty much the same there. So uh, the, the the verdict is Intel was right. They have made huge leaps. I mean, just, just getting to parity with with uh, uh, AMD and, and their integrated Vega graphics on this generation is huge because they were so far behind for so long. So getting Sorry, parity, could you say that again? Intel parity. reaching parity with AMD? In, in I, I love cases. that phrase. Yeah. And because uh, that's one area with those integrated graphics, that's one area where Intel has yep. been behind for so long. And, and so they're there with, with these systems. They're not gaming first systems. These aren't something you're going to buy to to take to your LAN party. But this is like, hey, I got this as a business system. You know, it's a nice 15 watt low power kind of uh it's a portable but still powerful system, uh, and when I'm on a business trip, I can still fire up my uh, my older or my less demanding games and get playable frame rates with Intel or AMD. So you really can't go wrong there. The one factor, though, is price. Uh, with with very limited availability of Ice Lake, uh, the price is I think that the price between these two systems, the difference was 600 bucks. Now there's some differences in the actual hardware that account for that. But you are going to pay a price premium. You're not going to be finding these higher performing G7 Ice Lake parts on your cheaper systems. You're going to be closer to the $2,000 price range. So keep that in mind and uh, and also look for more systems. This, this Dell was the first one out, uh, but Razer, HP, Lenovo, uh, they all have systems coming uh, with Ice Lake processors in them uh, in the next, uh, hopefully next few weeks. You know, at one time, Intel was so fragmented in their graphics that it they had something like 12 different designs actually in production at the same time that they had these little subgroups working off kind of you know the main idea of the architecture and inserting different things and their software and driver teams were were pulling their hair out trying to support all of these different not dissimilar products and so it's it's uh it's really nice to see that they have decided that graphics are are important, and instead of just trying to, you know, do a Larabee tile type type thing, and uh, you know further fragment the market, um, you know they're 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 concentrating their their uh, their design in, into something that's it's pretty good. It uh, you know it looks like it runs well, and especially at that thermal envelope and power consumption. So, you know, they're doing some things right. And I think that their software guys uh, who are doing driver development, they're they're catching up pretty quickly. I mean, NVIDIA is still kind of there at the top. AMD is just a little bit below. Uh, but Intel is, is, is catching up. I mean, these are things that, that are important to people. I mean, in theory, you could have really fast hardware. But, of course, if you don't have the software drivers, then you're you're out of luck except for like one or two big games and that's it. So it's, it's, um, uh, it's nice to see it's going to drive competition. Uh, AMD is seeing their advantage there getting eaten away just as Intel has kind of seen their CPU advantage getting eaten away. So it's, you know, it's some good and interesting balance there. I think AMD still has an advantage in software and, uh, gaming support and name recognition. So, yeah, it's it's going to see the the changes, the ebbs and flows in the marketplace now that Intel is is focusing on the entire SoC rather than just doing, hey, we're going to get this kick-ass CPU, but you know, graphics are you know, something we can kind of think about. And I, and I agree with you, and I think that's exactly what Intel's long-term strategy is. But I do want to be clear: uh, the their situation right now is kind of a mess. Because these Iris Plus Gen 11, formerly known as Gen 11 graphics, the, the high-end one, are only available on the top, I think, two Ice Lake SKUs. You get uh, lower-gen G5 graphics 
on the mid ones and then the, the lowest end ones stick with the Intel UHD graphics. And then of course, 10th gen, as we know, is not just Ice Lake, they've fragmented it. So you've got, um, is it, uh, not Coffee Lake, um, Comet. Comet, Comet Lake. So you've got Comet Lake at 14 nanometers. You've got a different, uh, a different uh, architectures, different graphics chipsets, different uh, names that are confusing as we talked about last week. So just because you're buying a 10th gen chip, you see that nice little silver 10th gen badge on a, on a laptop doesn't mean you're going to be getting these new graphics. So pay attention to the specific CPU that you're getting to make sure that uh, if that is important to you, that you get the right, the right model. Cause it just, just, it's, make it's a mess. Bad kitty. Make. Don't eat the cords, kitty. Bad kitty. Oh, just behind yeah. you. Should be all right. Make use of Intel's extremely digestible uh, naming scheme and you'll you'll never yes, and just like plus, plus plus if you don't see the g7 at the end of it then you know it's not iris plus which means it won't be 10 nanometer but it's 10th gen but it could still have just uhd graphics like you know yes hd yeah. 630 or whatever the heck it is that's in those so uh let's move on to the next uh review we've got a keyboard review from chris coke on some of these uh smart keyboards from DOS keyboard, uh, and I, I believe Sebastian, you uh, you got this into the system, uh, so hopefully you. I did. I did, and in fact, I had these keyboards on hand for quite some time before I finally pawned them off on Chris. And it's, I my initial impressions of these are exactly what he concluded, which is it's interesting to some people, perhaps it's okay. Here, let me just give you some background. DOS keyboard, I think it was in 2016, did a crowdfunding campaign for a smart keyboard. And it was fully funded. It took them a couple of years to actually get it out on the market. I want to say these came out in early 2018. Um, and we've had these for a few months. So these are not a brand new product. In fact, they have another new smart keyboard model that's out there as well. But That's what they the should do. About- they should go capless now. Yeah, I think right. The, just scroll up Remember? a bit, and you use the the arrow keys there are capless. So screw you know the old DOS keyboard with no labels on the buttons. <laughs> well, Chris Skip took the off key the caps. keycaps. Chris took off the keycaps so we could look at the difference between the different key switches because there's two different switches at play here. They use some Cherry MX Browns. They have their own proprietary switch, but that's not really what this is about. The story is that you can use their software to program the keyboard using different nat- notification delivery services to have your keyboard act as a notification center for you. And the puzzling thing to me about this is, okay, even in 2016, but especially now, here we are three years later, the proliferation of smartphones has reached, it's it's so saturated that now we're starting to see a bit of a regression. Not this is about smartphones, but we're starting to see year over year growth slowing Samsung phones and especially Apple phones are not necessarily um, having those big annual increases they'd like to see. And it, a lot of the feedback has been that people, most people have a smartphone at this point, and then they're kind of hanging on to it longer, but their usage patterns haven't really changed the last few years people rely on their phone for notifications so is it useful when almost anyone is going to be sitting their smartphone down somewhere near their keyboard on the desk when they're using their pc to expect that i will ignore the notifications that come in on my phone and instead pay attention to a blinking eight key or maybe the escape key is blinking red which signifies something which i have to remember like oh when m is blinking that means i have a new email or maybe G for a new Gmail or something. But then I, I, I personally think for keyboards of like this premium ilk, because these have an MSRP of $199 a piece. And there are some differences between the two models. One of them's geared more towards the so-called gaming segments. One of them is more of a subdued, uh, more of like an office keyboard, but... They both have RGB backlighting. One is significantly brighter than the other. They're just kind of odd. If you've followed DOS keyboard for a long time, you'll know that they were the guys who had an all-black keyboard that didn't even have anything on the keys. They were just completely blank, stealthy, like, hacker keyboards. And they have they came to market with something different, to their credit. They executed the product well. Like, there's no 
there's no question that these notifications work properly. If you sign up for a service, like I want to say one of them is IFFFT. There's a second one. You can link it up to different things like social media and other notification services that will handle things like new emails. You can have weather alerts, stand alerts, all sorts of things. But I don't know if... Yeah, maybe Chris and I are in agreement on this. I don't know how you guys feel about the usefulness of notifications coming from a backlight on your keyboard versus if there was like a secondary screen on the keyboard with notifications. Like think of think of all the Asus laptops that were announced this year with screens all over them. They've got a second screen above the keyboard that can display any number of things or even be a secondary display for the operating system. And then you have a $200 keyboard that has no screen on it whatsoever and you're supposed to be content with one of the keys is blinking and that means something. I, I, I don't have the patience to set that up and I certainly don't have the mental capacity to remember why the freaking eight is blinking at me. I mean, it's it's like, you know, it would, used to be you'd buy a, 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 a plane aircraft simulator game and you had that whole big you know, semi stiff cardboard sheet. Oh, that had all James. The right. <laughs> and damn it. If it didn't take you a month to figure out all of those things. And it's just too much damn work when I could look at my cell phone and hit the little, um, you know, thing in the back and I pull down the, and it tells me exactly what, I'm looking at, and it even beeps at me, and I can carry it with me, unlike my keyboard, or I can put it right next to my keyboard. So I think that I, you know, I'm not trying to hammer on them because they're obviously looking to add value and features to their product. But yeah, in this age of of, of cell phones, where you just have one with you, and whatever things that you want to have pop up are going to pop up and it's going to do that in a manner that will tell you exactly, you know, Twitter is on fire and Jack is not doing things that you want him to do. And, and as compared to like, you know, my, my caps lock is blinking. And here's the thing that drove me nuts about this. Cause I did demo these before I sent them off. When it starts blinking, my first reaction is, oh, uh, escape is blinking. Let me tap escape and see what that's all about. That doesn't do anything. It just is a reminder to you to open up the application to see what the actual reminder is, which you can then click through to find out what the notification was for. Otherwise, so it's, it's a just, reminder. It's a reminder to remind to you their, to remind yeah. to click the key that you have and, to remember so that you can get a reminder. And I thought there was something coming in a further software update. I didn't see Chris make any mention of this, so apparently not. But I was thinking, you know, if if this was ever going to be useful at all, and one of the things that they had mentioned was, you know, the escape key blinks red to let you know that your garage door just opened. I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, my cell phone's not going to tell me that my garage door just opened unless I have some smart garage door opener that triggers a home automation alert. That it is I really want to know, do they have a key that blinks when kids are running across my lawn? You know, it's one of the great things about this, Josh, is that anyone can create an alert, and you could you could have that. You could have that kids get off kids my lawn, lawn alert, yeah, and it would yeah. be L for lawn. L would blink, yeah. blink green, yeah. blinking for lawn. dramatically in red. Yeah, <laughs> I love this. It's all green. About. Chat it's gotta be green. Crap, my check keyboard light just came on. Yes, you two <laughs> could have Put dashboard notifications that. It's like, I don't know how to go in and turn this off, so I just have black tape over the escape key now. So My delete oh. key is blinking. What do you mean, PC load letter? <laughs> and also, I think, too, this is common to DOS keyboard. Uh, so these, these are expensive. They're 150 to $200. Uh, but they're not really for gamers or like really kind of like power users because they don't offer macro support. And at that price level, I mean, that's really limiting the kind of audience who would otherwise potentially be interested in this feature set. So yes, I, I will say Chris did a, did his best to be as objective as possible. And yet, if you read his review, you will see that 
There probably is not much of a market for these yet. For whatever reason, if you go to their website right now, DOS keyboard is featuring smart keyboards all over the top of the page, and they have multiple models. So I hope this strategy does not hurt them because, I mean, traditionally they've offered great stuff. But overall, quality of the keyboards was also not especially high. It was not up to the standard you would think of for a keyboard of this price level where they're using thin, like, single-shot ABS keycaps and just kind of the overall feel is not that premium. So hopefully this runs its course and they move on to something a little bit uh, more conventional. Because, I mean, it's a keyboard. People still use IBM Model M keyboards. You know why? Because they're great. And you don't well, need to do anything better than that. People... Well, you need three dongles YouTubers, to make it work, but still. You know, I... Well, okay, I will say... There is one problem with the IBM Model M. It's not RGB. That's not a problem. That's yeah. No. That's hmm. There's a huge problem. Okay, do you do you see this? This is yeah, I, I, it's current year, Jeremy. This is what, what a desktop is supposed to look night, like, man. I see your future and so many RGBs, so many RGBs. Well, let's talk about something that I don't. think think has RGBs in it. I probably should have checked this review more carefully. I don't think it does. It does not. does not. And this, this, is, this is something we've heard about. Uh, I think we first saw it like demoed at CES last year or earlier this year. This is yeah. the HyperX Cloud Orbit S gaming headset with Odyssey positional audio technology, right? Oh, well, the Odyssey or, makes no, the driver. Odyssey drivers. is the driver. I'm sorry. Yes. Odyssey yep. is the planner magnetic uh, driver. Yes, and okay, this so, it uses this Waves NX 3D that's audio right. technology. That's right. Which so we gotta, yeah we both demoed this at CES, Jim and I, and they've been showing this huh. since then. And we we went through it. Basically, we know everything about Are these. You guys but like identical? Aren't shipping them yet? Hmm? Identical, Jim and I. Jim and I. No. Hmm. I don't know what I am. I was born in Gemini. January. Gemini. Am I a Capricorn? Like, I don't know. The, I don't know my size. I don't know. Me. But anyway, Gemini. So Gemini were, you know, <clears throat> by the old planar magnetic guys. Right. And anyway. Odyssey, I, I did a review of some Odyssey or Odyssey. I've heard it pronounced different ways, but I did a review of, of their sign headphones like three years ago. And at that time, uh, the Is market that was a little bit different. S-I-G-N or S-I-N? S -I -N -E. Are we going geometry here? Yes. Oh, S I N E. And they were a four hundred and fifty to five hundred dollar, depending on whether you got one with a lightning connector or not. Planar magnetic on ear headphone that at that time was their cheapest option. Because I mean, I've demoed the L C D X, I think the L C D three. They have this L C D series which ranges up to and above, I think, $3,000. And the entry level of that series is $1,699. This is a company that makes very expensive headphones. And planar magnetic technology is different than your traditional dynamic driver in a headphone. It's not using a cone. It's using a very thin sheet of some sort of material like mylar. You can imprint a almost two-dimensional cone on it, like the actual motor driver on this sheet and then suspend the sheet in a frame that's held in place by magnets. And the whole thing is it's, it, it's a very different way to move air. Basically it's, it's very precise. It has the ability to move and stop faster than a traditional cone would. It doesn't have the breakup like the edge, uh, the issues with, with different cone materials. We are always going for that, that stiffest possible, but lightest possible. Yeah, because it, it has uh, like no mass whatsoever. Yeah. And I've, I've struggling had to tweeters describe this. in the past that, that were these, but these were like in the 80s. I mean, they were developed a long time ago. And so I had a pair of Mitsubishi speakers that only the tweeter was an actual kind of cone, but then the mid-range and the actual driver were, were flat plane things. And it, it made great sound but they're hard to make and make well they've been getting cheaper that's the thing like the in the headphone world anyway because i mean the, the loudspeaker market even though i'm a big fan of loudspeakers and especially tall speakers that's a shrinking 
subset of a shrinking market, people who buy speakers typically buy bookshelf speakers. And even though in America since 1969, there's been this company called Magnapan making planar magnetic speakers. And I have a pair of them. I have the MG12s, which are like four feet tall. but They're only about an inch thick. And that's all just a wooden frame. The actual speaker itself is this thin material that you wouldn't think it would produce powerful sound, but it can fill a room and it sounds like real live music because it's it's like pushing air in both directions. You have to have them out in the middle of your room. And so the, the idea of having that kind of technology, but much more conveniently located just on your head and not dominating a room to have it set up properly is is fascinating to me. And these are a very well-realized implementation of planar magnetic technology in a gaming headset. And actually, Odyssey makes their own gaming headset, which is essentially the same thing. This is HyperX, uh, this product, this Cloud Orbit S X. Cloud Orbit S is a HyperX product. But they've essentially taken the, I think it's called the Mobius gaming headset, which is a $400 gaming headset from Odyssey. And they've brought it down $100 to the $300 marks, which is obviously very expensive. Highest end of the gaming headset market. The Sennheisers of the world, everything else that's in that premium category. And you can get a hell of a good deal on gaming headphones that are $100 or less, as we will probably hear about shortly. But for what this is, and if you are a planar magnetic fan, this is getting into planar magnetic drivers in a gaming headset for the lowest cost we've seen to date. And yeah, you can go out and buy some Hi-Fi Man. I saw some on Amazon yesterday that were marked all the way down to 179 You can buy the Monoprice, very well-regarded Monoprice, um, like entry-level planar magnetic headphones for about $180 as well. But with this, you're not only getting the planar magnetic headphone, but you're also getting a very good microphone. If what you're hearing from me, I'm wearing the headset right now is any indication. It's pretty good for a gaming headset. You're also getting this 3D positional audio technology, which was not for me. I didn't particularly care for the effect, but it depends on what you're doing and what your preferences are. Because it's, it's very interesting. Like I think, Jim, you, you also tested this out at CES, and obviously there was a lot of noise. But what they do is they sort of center, they calibrate what the center is for you. And you can go in and change like you know your total head circumference and intraoral distance and stuff and make it more accurate. But essentially, there are accelerometers in each ear cup that are tracking exactly how your head is moving. And they have sound that is then projected from this imaginary point. So even if you move your head, the sound remains constant in this virtual environment, right? And it basically sounds like you're in a room and there's a sound source somewhere ahead of you, right, in, in the center. And as you move around, you, you are fooled into thinking that the sound source has stayed constant while you have moved. So I move to my left and the sound is now somewhere in the right channel. I move to my left and the sound is in the left or I move to my right and the sound's in the left channel. So it's interesting. It does create a sort of wraparound audio effect and it did have an adjustable ambience so you could make it more or less ambient. You could have it sound like you were in a much larger space or a much smaller space. So it was But it was are they transparent? How's the sound stage? It's very, very good. I but there was, <laughs> there was two different. I, there's are the mid ranges warm? Are they? No, they leave you cool. Is the bass it's, punchy but not boomy? It's not boomy. It is extended, but it is not prominent. So if you're listening, so not to, lush. No, they were they're they're not I wouldn't say they're analytical, and that's a term that gets thrown around a lot, like something is really cold and precise. It's not like that. There is a bit of warmth to them. Not nearly as much as those sign headphones that I tested a couple of years ago, but it I would say this is a very flat frequency response, surprising amount of lower bass, but that's something that some of these newer planar magnetic headphones have going for them is that they're very flat in the low frequencies. They don't they don't roll off. 
And then a lot of these bigger drivers, like you get a gaming headset with 50 millimeter drivers that has a lot of low bass. It's kind of boomy bass and it will overshadow the mid range. It will make it sound like the bass is really forward in the mix all the time. And some of them have an artificially boosted bass response anyway. Like they've been designed for bass and everything else kind of suffers. And I will say even before this headset, my impression of HyperX headsets in general was that they had a bit of what I call a smile EQ, where you have higher bass, lower mid-range, and then back up on the treble again. And it creates a sort of softer sound. There isn't that attack from mid-range. And any any headphone with a lot of mid-range is going to sound perhaps more detailed, but have a much more aggressive sound. Grado is a great example of this. Grado has a slight hump in the mid-range. So they have a lot more presence for things like human voices, instruments, and less bass and treble response as a result. But I'll tell you that those, those grados, they, they still have some good bass. It's all about the, bass. and their sound stage is really fantastic. You close your eyes and you're surrounded by music and, and just a stereo. But anyway, that we're not talking about grados. No, and I will say the whole soundstage argument, some of it, I think, when you listen to stereo music and you you feel like it's really wide, to me, that's just better stereo separation. If you have a headphone that sounds really narrow, there's probably some bleeding going on between the left and right channels, either in the connector or somehow in the way that it's wired. So no, or or is, just signal to noise is, is just mm, bad. And so yeah, it, that'll affect yeah. clarity, too. Yeah. These these are digital. Like I'm connected to USB type C right now. And you can connect these either analog or digital. But it's funny because the analog input is treated as an aux input and then this is doing all the work. It has it has an internal battery and only in analog mode does it switch over to battery power because these these drivers would not be conducive to use with something like a smartphone. If if you were to plug this in with just a 3.5 millimeter cable to a smartphone, you're probably not giving it enough juice for these to really produce good audio. They know this. There's a built-in battery. Only gets used in analog mode, which is kind of odd. And I thought, you know, why isn't there a wireless implementation here somewhere? You've got the battery already built in. They offer about a 10-hour battery life. That's if you have, I think it's like at 50% volume. So it'll be less if you listen to higher volumes. But the problem I ran into was even with the volume turned all the way up, they don't get as loud on battery. So if you're listening to them either with a smartphone or if you're connecting it via 3.5 millimeter to a game controller, if I want to use it with my PS4, for example, then I'm not getting quite the impact as I would if I was at the PC. And that affects things like dynamics. Uh, if it If it needs to get loud, if there's an explosion, if there's a louder passage, they felt a little compressed because it never got as loud on battery. So definitely, I thought this was a better headphone to use at the PC with USB than 3.5 millimeter. But the the one thing you get if you get the Odyssey version of this rather than the HyperX is Bluetooth. They have Bluetooth with AAC, SBC, and LDAC, which you know LDAC is the proprietary Sony thing that's higher uh, higher quality than regular Bluetooth, but Anyway, for it's, I my conclusion was basically that they're extremely well executed. They sound very good. They have that characteristic kind of planar magnetic sound, which is very, very crisp, very accurate, very fast. You hear things that you don't necessarily hear with other types of drivers if you're paying attention. But not the best for a bass head. Like if you just want boomy, like deep bass response, listening to modern pop music, for example they're going to sound a little less intense on the low end, even though it's there, it's just not as intense. And then of course the price tag means you kind of have to know what you want. You you've tried out planar magnetics. You love the sound. This gets you into planar magnetics for a gaming headset for 300 bucks or 329 If you get the version with the head tracking, which you can play around with or just turn off. There's actually a switch on these to turn off the 3d audio. How excited were you when, when they came and, and said, do you want to review these? It's like, hey, planar magnetic. 
these are things that were, you know, went to CES a couple of years ago, and I remember listening to when they're six hundred bucks at the pop for for Odyssey. I mean, it sounded nice, but one, it was really loud in 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 the area. But now you get a chance to to test out that same technology while you're at home without your it's, kids it's screaming. It's the dream, much. It's the dream, Josh. And speaking of kids screaming, pretty good uh, noise isolation. Nice. Although no, so it's, it's no not active open noise back? cancellation, but no, they're closed back. Wow. Over ear closed back. Very, very good cushion. I didn't even talk about that. It's memory foam in the top on the sides. It's about 13 ounces, so not the lightest headset by any stretch, but still comfortable. And does a really good job of kind of isolating outside sound. And I've worn them for longer periods. They're not uncomfortable, but you do start to kind of notice the weight after a while. But batteries, yeah. batteries, dude. Yep, exactly. Well, all right. So, a so I'll, review I'll for change. Those. I'll trade you my review headset for, for yours. We'll talk about that. Right. That, so we'll, we'll leave it. Uh, I believe the, the exact phrase you used to sum these up was extended, but not prominent. There you go. Which unfortunately I've heard all too often. Oh. Well, let's move on to yeah. Josh's <laughs> review. He's got another headset, something not quite as high end. It is the easy, or I'm sorry, easy SMX VIP 002S RGB gaming headset. So Josh, take a look at this, uh, look at okay, this for us. So, uh, take it away. You know, they, uh, they contacted me a couple of months back. I'm like, Hey, do you want to review these headphones? They're not terribly expensive, but we feel good about them. And I was like, mm, I'm fine. Sent them to me and I started using them. And I was kind of shocked because these were selling at the time for about 25 bucks on Amazon. And I thought, how good could $25 headphones be? And let me tell you, they're shockingly good. They are not audiophile quality sound. However, the reproduction is still very good. The, the issues that I had primarily with it was we didn't have great stereo separation. Sound field was, was really, the sound stage was, was really narrow. But it reproduced the highs very well. I mean, they're 40 millimeter drivers. They produced mid-range that was really natural sounding. And they produced bass that 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 was still pretty deep, but not not this big boomy, annoying, over-presence type bass. And I thought that, you know, the the balance of these are really, really quite good. The the musicality is is pretty decent for because you know if you've ever picked up a an inexpensive set of headphones that are not great you will hear some distortion you will hear things getting glossed over that 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 you know come to the fore with with better audio um you know playback um Bad recordings just sound okay when on bad stuff because it, it just masks so many of the things. And so when you have a better set of headphones, you have more detail. And so, you know, if you've got a bad recording, you you will hear those those issues. Now, this is this is really, you know, it, it's it it retails at $36 on their website. You can currently get it the 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 analog version for $45 on Amazon. And that's before any kind of rebates that you could potentially apply to it. And, uh, you know, it, it, it is a surprisingly good product. It's, it's got the pleather, uh, ear cups, which for about an hour work pretty well, but then it starts getting a little moisture in there. It is RGB, which is awfully exciting to some people, but the RGB only works. So it, it, it has, a kind of three position, three and a half millimeter jack that does microphone left, right. And they include a splitter, which puts that into the audio in, you know, left, right. And then the microphone. So you can plug that into a PC or you could plug it and, you know, take that off and plug it into your phone and still have audio and microphone. And it's got a USB jack that you plug in to get the, uh, you know, it, it provides the power for the RGB and the muting functionality of the microphone. So if you look 
below the volume control, which is on the left cup, there's a little button there and it's the mic mute or on. And it has a little light on the end of your microphone that lights up when it's active. Though you're going to have a hard time seeing that from the angle of, uh, of uh, where it's at at your face. But, you know, it's there. It's, it's functionality. And, and it's got on the, the right hand controls what color the RGB is. And then on the left is, is volume. And so you've got the volume and the mute right there. And it's just really simple to use. You get something that, you know, it gets really loud. You just do up your hand and, and it you don't you don't spend time trying to find some key on your keyboard and uh you know turn things down. Or, you know, the wife comes in and starts yelling at you, you can quickly just, you know, flip that down and talk to her. Or maybe just turn it up and ignore. But um the, the thing that, that probably impressed me most was the quality of the build. Uh, my teenage kid has been using them for the past couple of months, and he's incredibly hard on headphones. And these look like they're brand new out of the box, and they feel that they've got the same stiffness. They've got, you know, the flexibility. They, 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 I mean, the microphone uh, boom still works. It, the, the boom does not flex in and out, which is a little disappointing. It only goes up and down. And I've done some audio recordings, which, you know, the mic is okay, but don't expect anything like, you know, a condenser mic, a condenser diaphragm mic, like what we're using here in, in the podcast, but it still is, is, is clear. It's got a little bit noise in the background, but it, it still does good with voices, but you know, for less than 50 bucks, you got RGB, you've got good audio, you've got microphone, you've got you know, a, a volume control in you know, integrated in the headset. You got a mute control for the microphone in the headset, and they have tuned these drivers. and And they're not the the best signal to noise ratio. It's like ninety two decibels plus or minus whatever. And yeah, you're gonna see better stuff on better high end things, but they've tuned it all so that it just works really well. I mean, they've, they've kind of sacrificed the soundstage and separation, but other than that, it's pretty good. Now, it is a pretty high impedance um, set of headphones. I mean, it's it's standard 32 ohm, but as I mentioned, uh, measured it from uh, the sound card that I had, it, it was doing about 37 ohms, and part of that is you've got a splitter involved, which... It's going to add impedance. And then you've got a volume control on, on your left cup that, again, is it's going to increase impedance. If you turn it all the way up and measure it, it's, it's you know, 37 ohms. And that's kind of within their plus or minus of, of you know, with their advertisements. So they're covering their, their behind there. But, you know, if you've got a PC with an integrated amp, like a lot of higher-end motherboards have, these are great sounding motherboards for not a whole lot of money and they're durable and they look pretty good. And the RGB effects are not over the top. And so all of these things together and for under 50 bucks, and again, you, you find it for as low as $25 at times. These are a great set of headphones for gaming and music and, and, and movies and, and videos and, and whatever else you can throw at it because they're just really solid. They're comfortable. They're robust. I mean, if, if you look at the Amazon page, they got a guy twisting them, you know, literally 180 degrees. I mean, it's, and, and they're not bending. It's, it's a big thick metal strip that, uh, you know, can, can adjust and it's, in, and it's surrounded by like, eight screws in total with uh, two different clamps in there. So, I mean, it's it's not moving. It's not, you know, my kid who destroys everything has not been able to even touch these things, which is awesome. There, look, right in the middle there. That person bending the living crap out of the headphones. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, show that. I mean, if you're enjoying applying pain to things, that's... Mm. 
that's where it's at. I mean, you can you can. That's how I always put my headphones on. Yeah. <laughs> there are people in the world that probably do. But anyway, yeah, uh, yeah no, it's uh, you know I, I gave it a gold award. It's a great product from a company that I'd never heard of. Uh, the audio is is shockingly good for the price, and they add a lot of features to it, and it's it's damn near indestructible. And you gotta love that with with headset. I mean, I mean the cord. I mean, if you could look in to see where it's anchored, it's it's got a big old plastic flexible anchor that you know things like Grado doesn't have. I mean, if you look in there, it's it's. Yeah, it's it's just robust and they're awesome. Again, the only real issue I had is after about an hour, you would get a little sweaty with that pleather, and then you take it off for a couple of minutes. It dissipates in my very very dry uh, climate, and you put it back on again, and you're good to go for you know another hour. But other than that, you know, I had to give it a gold war. It, it was a really good set of headphones that, if you catch it in time. It was 25 bucks right now. Amazon 45, 46. But if you order directly from SMX, it's 35 99, I think, or 34 99. But it's, it's inexpensive for the quality and the functionality that you get. All right. So that's a gold award for the easy SMX VIP 002S RGB gaming headphones or, you know, 25 to 35 bucks, somewhere in there, maybe 40 bucks at the high end, but, Uh, We've got both ends of the spectrum for you here at PC Perspective. We've got the $300 high end and the budget, but still high quality uh, on the low end. Let's quickly move on to another review. Uh, We've got a power supply review from Lee. Uh, This time it's the Corsair RM750, which is a 750 watt gold rated fully modular power supply. Uh, I think it's priced at about $120. So it's not a bad price for a, a gold rating from a good uh, manufacturer at that wattage. And uh, as as always, Lee does complete full uh, testing that probably could only be appreciated by an electrical engineer, uh, but head over to the site to read the full review. Uh, I will note that he the one thing uh, he mentioned, well, he mentioned two things. First, uh, everything hit all of its markers, its its efficiencies and its, um, its what's the word, drifting or its, uh, all, all the electrical stuff was good. It was It was where it was supposed to be. It's got a 135 millimeter fan uh, that does have a quiet operation mode where, you know, if under low load, it can it can go silent and then shut down. But he noticed a little quirk, which was that it will, if you start from zero, like you start up your computer and you're at a low load where it would normally be shut down, it still operates at a, a low RPM, very quiet. It's silent up to about a 40% load, he said. But to get it to shut off completely, completely you've got to give it a load, get it all the way up, you know, near 100 and then back it down. And once it backs down and gets down below into like the thirties, it'll shut off the fan. So for some reason, it doesn't shut it off uh, on the way up, only on the way down. So uh, not sure about that. But even then he said, like I said, it's it's pretty much silent up to a 40% uh, load. So uh, very good uh, ratings. Like I said, check the full review. That's the Corsair RM750, 750 watt gold rated power supply, fully modular, about 120 bucks. Uh, and you can pick it up at Amazon. All right, last review. Let's. Uh, we're at a, an hour and twenty minutes now, and we're still getting yeah. through the reviews. Uh, so, <laughs> hey, and it got, wasn't even all the reviews. That's the yes, alarming we had thing. To, we had to save some for next week because it was a busy couple of weeks here. But Sebastian's got the uh, next review for us, which is a uh, a neat little accessory if you need some easy hot swap storage in your desktop. It's the Icy Dock Tough Armor Light. MB607SP-B. It's a four bay, uh, uh, two and a half inch hot swap uh, enclosure that can fit into a five and a quarter inch bay on your your PC. Yes. And this is one of those things that is made possible by having an external five and a quarter inch bay. So if you have a case with one of those bays, hang on to it because you can do stuff like this. And actually, this is around $90 or so, and I've seen it for less. I think I saw it for as little as 80 uh on Amazon at one point, but it, it, the reason this costs what it does, and I've seen solutions like this that are in like the 40 to $50 range. They're typically all plastic. This is all metal. And by all metal, I mean the actual drive trays are metal, the front plate is metal, the unit itself is all metal. So it, it was an impressively constructed thing. It's part of their Tough Armor series, hence all the metal. But 
it's it gives you the option of uh, actively cooling or passively cooling. There's a switch on the back, go from off to low to high on the included fan, which was actually pretty quiet unless you had it in the high mode. It wasn't any louder than the Hyper 212 cooler in the, the system that I was testing this in. And just basically, it's, I mean, it supports it supports hot swap, but what really this is is just a sort of carriage for your drives. You're just you're still interfacing with the drives via either your motherboard SATA ports or if you have a SAS controller card, these also work with SAS, obviously. One 15-pin SATA connector is all it takes to power this thing, which is convenient. And apparently that provides just, you know, plenty of juice to run all four of these drives, not issue plus the fan and have any problems at all. I ended up putting four of the same model SSD in this thing, enabling hot swap and just kind of checking out their behavior and performance in Windows 10. And I didn't run into any issues at all. They'd actually, they also sent along a drive adapter. If you have M dot, or if you have SATA M.2 drives, and you want to use an enclosure like this, they sell a low-cost uh, little adapter that's quite nice, actually. It's completely tool-free, works with all the different sizes with, like, this easy adjusting on the inside. But mostly what I focused but on if was, you were yeah. a normal person like Josh and I and had five and a quarter bays, just think how many drives you could fit in there. And this isn't even their... They this have is a two and a half. Different. Yeah, but they have they have a two and a half that supports six drives with these little slim uh, drive trays. They have a ton of things. That so you're telling can... me I can fit about like a ten, maybe a dozen into a five and a quarter inch bay. Well, if you have two bays, you could fit as many as sixteen. I think if you go, I, I all have out, two bays. Just go with seven millimeter. Even SSDs. with my DVD ROM, I still have two bays. See. Think about how many SSDs you could be running from the front panel of your computer right now. I am fond of mind boggles. Speak. I mean, at some point you're going to run out of SATA headers, but at that point, buy a controller card. Buy two controller cards. At some, Arica. you're going to turn into you're going to turn into Alan Malventano at some point. The more the more of these you buy, and the more SSDs you buy, and the more controllers you buy, at some point you will have. Something that may approach what he has just on his desk. Gonna have to lose a lot of weight, though. Oh well, maybe it, you I'll, need to I'll spend some time on a nuclear SSDs. sub. I, I'll just say it's extremely well made. It does exactly what it it says, but it sets about. If that makes any sense, what they intended for this product, it's not for everybody. If you have a front panel that you'd like to populate with a bunch of SSDs and be able to hot swap them. This is great. I don't know if it's for every home user, but it's a well-realized product. And ICDoc has a ton of stuff. Like if you have any interest in any kind of external storage solution like this, they have one for you. We're talking slim optical drive bays in a laptop that you can turn into an SSD hot swap. It's they've they've got a ton of stuff. So two terabyte death wish raid. Yeah. Just in a core two out. duo laptop, they can make it happen. Yeah, I'm sold. All right, so check out the IC Doc Tough Armor uh, review here. And as Sebastian indicated, check out the IC Doc website if you want to just look. And they do indeed have pretty much every configuration of drive enclosure and expander and adapter that you could possibly, uh, at least practically, re uh, imagine. Uh, but let's. Uh, That's let's... what Thunderbolt's for. Yes, that's right. Thanks to Tim Cook, my all-in-one Mac Pro from about six years ago now has 15 wires sticking out of it. So, anyway, uh, let's. Uh, that was the last review. Uh, so, uh, good job, guys. We made it through the the review marathon, and let's jump into the news now. This next story we we kind of already talked about, um, but let's just uh, quickly uh, summarize it here. It's it's the uh, the the news on on the changes and the the confusion a bit around what's happening with with Ryzen processors and these AGISA updates and BIOS uh, changes. So, Jeremy, tell us tell us what's going on with, with this story here. Well, I mean, we've got two separate issues. One we haven't really seen before, but 
uh, and nor is AMD, but they're fully owning up to it. And one that's been bothering us since the inception of Windows 10. Uh, Der Bauer, uh, who, if you don't mod your BIOS or overclock, you've probably never heard of. On the other hand, if you ever have, you know exactly who this person is. I did a study and looked at uh, the new Ryzen third generation processors and found that I believe it was 5.6% of those posting benchmarks were actually seeing boost clocks across all cores that matched what the advertisements were saying. It's, it's kind of nasty. Uh, and honestly, like, so if you take your multi-core Ryzen processor and put it to one core, you will absolutely totally peg that boost clock and beyond. Uh, there are things, there are certain BIOS updates, and uh, if you if you're running the Ryzen Master, so that you can do the the clocking for Ryzen specifically, you generally sort of get around it, and you're going to see the boost clocks, but. For the vast majority of people that are buying the higher end processors, they're just not seeing what they sort of paid for. In what is uh, you know totally respectful, I, AMD immediately looked at it and said, "Ah, uh, yeah, that's decent research. You are absolutely correct, and we're going to start pushing out BIOS updates. We're expecting to hear on September 10th uh, when they're going to arrive because." I one of the fun things about being able to pro, uh, having the com- compatibility of three generations of chipsets uh, on a processor is yeah you, it gets complex. They're, they're, you're juggling a lot of balls all at once, but we're going to hear fairly quickly about an update that should, in theory, solve this. There is the uh, slide right there for. Our audio viewers, it's uh, they're in the process of preparing a BIOS update for a motherboard processor or partners that addresses the issues, includes additional boost performance optimizations. We will provide an update on September 10th to the community regarding the availability of the BIOS. It's a hard hit for anyone that's gone out and bought a new Ryzen processor, but at the same time, Multi-core performance has been absolutely respectful. It's, it's you know, it, I, I want to be kind of mad, but at the same time, I'm understanding that they don't change chipsets every single time. They don't change pinouts do, every time. Things get complex. Do you think this is more splitting hairs, or do you think that there's some real issues here that, that need to be addressed? I don't think we have enough information, or at least I don't. You know, I th- I think that, you know, kind of the proof is in the pudding in that, yeah, benchmarks were a little higher or at least than, than what we've seen, but are they that much different? You know, I'm not trying to, you know, give give AMD a, a, an easy out here because, again, you know, their, their engineering and marketing need to communicate a lot better than, than what they were. I think that they were being As is tradition. optimistic. But, uh, you know, does it really fundamentally change the performance of their CPUs? And my guess here is not. I mean, you've got... No. Maybe one to two percent overall in, in in a lot of the benchmarks and real world world stuff, but you know people are like, "Hey, it, it promised me a four point four boost clock," and no matter how many services and processes that I cut out and try to hammer it with one thing, I never reach that. I'm hitting four point two eight 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 repeated. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's. Yeah. Electrons throw you, away from boost. You do want to know what you're getting and be accurate that way. And that's again marketing working with engineering. And they need to do yeah. get this in the bud in, in in April, May, and June. But at the same time, you know, some of their initial stuff did it say is like, yeah, this is gonna be fine, versus you know, later on it's like, yeah maybe longevity is going to be an issue here. Maybe 
some thermal um, throttling that we heat up certain parts of the CPU more than we expected. I, yeah, that's we, we my need, worry. We need more information badly. Yeah, but, but no, I think that's absolutely that, my worry. But I don't think it is going to end up that way, or at least knock on wood, it won't. This is not going to be ball game. No, where no. And, Nvidia chips just suddenly desolder from their substrate. This this is a couple of percentage of performance, if at that. So you know, take a deep breath and really pay attention and see what it means to you as a consumer versus the people who really are just so totally invested in this that any slight deviation and and they go nuts. And yeah. so leave taunting AMD marketing to us because we've been doing it for a long time. Sadly. One or two years. But we still then, haven't learned that lesson. The, the word uh, you said, Josh, which I think is, is right, is, is real world. And it's almost ironic because Intel, if you guys recall from Computex, was the one who pushed on us. So we need to focus on the real world. And so as this, <laughs> as this has been happening, uh, I, I don't have Ryzen yet. I haven't, I have some test systems. I haven't personally upgraded my rig. I'm waiting for the 3950X, but but my view has been, okay, if it's not going to hit 4.6, it's not going to hit this specific number. And obviously changes to the BIOS and changes to voltages can have real world implications. But if you're a Ryzen user and you're worried about this, go do the thing you bought the processor to do. Render a video, uh, you know, export uh, some photos, play a game, whatever it is you bought. And if it's still working for you, even if it's not hitting some magic number, because their performance advantage over Intel, especially in a price to performance uh, uh, analysis, was so great that, yeah, they can take a hit if, the, if this turns out to be a hit of a few percentage, oh. and they're still going to come out uh, on top. Apply the uh, <clears throat> meltdown. Uh, right, and that's fixes, true. And, and then and, see what happens. Exactly. Your Just Ryzen as, processor won't move a fucking smidgen. Right, and and we we may be waiting for more tweaks from AMD, uh, which may have impacts on performance. And but but who knows when the next speculative execution patch is going to come from Intel? It's it's you're, yeah. you you know you can't you can't tie your hands on on waiting for stuff like that. So and let Doesn't me this tell you, feel... let, let yeah. me tell you real quick. Um, I work in a company with four hundred plus computers, and suddenly over the past four weeks since we've had some updates with a lot of the mitigations mm -hmm. these laptops are becoming extremely unstable i mean they're freezing all the yeah. time we've updated bios we've updated drivers we've done everything we've uninstalled i think that you know it's my gut feeling i think that some of the mitigations and changes they've made have made things more unstable. And and again, I, I, I see this with hundreds of laptops. We've got, yeah, probably about 400 out there. And we've got suddenly, out of the blue, about 20 to 30 people who just suddenly start locking oh, up. Oh, no ouch. Apparent reason. I mean, systems that were stable, rock solid before. And then suddenly, all of these Windows 10 updates that apply these mitigations it's i don't know i'm not i'm not trying to you know cry wolf but they have become oh, so I mean, heavy it makes sense from a security point because would you rather oh it did get infected or oh it crashed running normal stuff intel's gonna go for yeah sorry it crashed uh yeah good luck with that but there's a second part to this which is the bloody RTC bug. Uh, it's reared its freaking ugly head again, uh, as it did uh, for several generations of Intel chips and definitely Ryzen since the inception of Windows 10. Essentially, it, it has a problem temporally. You got your B clock of, say, 100 megahertz. And if you underclock down to 98 megahertz and you run a benchmark, as far as Windows is concerned, it actually finished 2% quicker than it did because you underclocked. And so you get a higher synthetic benchmark rate. If you overclock to 102, 103, 
while it took 3% longer to run through the benchmark, and you will see lower scores than you would at the base B clock. This affects synthetic benchmarks. It does not really affect any real world performance whatsoever because it doesn't necessarily depend on the Windows RTC. It's been fixed before. It's been fixed for almost all the Intel, and Intel has figured out how to stop the newer generation from going uh, sort of sideways, apart from as we were discussing the mitigations. Uh, but for this exact moment, uh, HW Bot and a couple of the other official benchmarking sites are not accepting Ryzen third generation benchmark because, well, the RTC is kind of wacky right now. There is an alternative benchmark you can run which does accommodate that but if you're that obsessed about synthetic benchmarks you you better be overclocking with ln2 or else you're just sort of wasting your time all right well let's uh let's quickly stick with amd news and uh there's been as we talked about in previous shows the the question about Threadripper, uh, there was some concern about uh, when AMD unveiled its its uh, new Ryzen 3000 parts with those high core counts, there was some question of what room is left for Threadripper. Uh, Lisa Su and AMD officially came out and said, no, it's not dead. And we've got some new rumors on this third generation of Threadripper. Uh, tell us, Jeremy, uh, what's what's the, uh, the story? Well, we've got two unverified benchmarks. Uh, both of them are coming out of, and forgive me if it takes me a second to remember which one it is. Uh, sorry, the bench, the geek bench. So one of the, one of our great sources of leaks is unspecified shark tooth processor benchmark on geek bench four. So we saw one the very, very, very beginning, or sorry, last month, because bloody hell, it's September, uh, <laughs> where they were they were seeing significantly higher uh, boost clocks than what we're seeing with this new leak. Uh, so before we knew that the base clock was going to be 2.2 gigahertz, or sorry, 3.6 gigahertz. Uh, I'm getting this backwards. There was no information whatsoever on a boost clock. It was just a bit of information off of what Geekbench offers. The scores were 94,772 points in multi-threaded mode in the original leak. More recently, we saw a second one, which saw the base clock drop significantly from 3.6 down to 2.2 gigahertz. Uh, but we did see a boost clock of 4.1 gigahertz. What the kicker is, as you can see right there, if you're on video and on audio, the Geekbench dropped almost 20,000 points from 94K down to 68K. This is all rumors. Uh, that it's, it's hard to put anything on this because we got no information on the motherboard on the speed of the ram which as we know for most of amd architecture right now significantly impacts the performance of your processor and the the drop of the base clock it, it i almost have to wonder if it's like amd is looking at what intel has been doing with their base clocks which are dropping them down to ancient celeron levels of 1.3, 1.8 gigahertz, and say, now, nah, well, if that's okay, and we can still hit the boost, why don't we drop the base down a bit? Drop our advertised uh, TDP, or if you're Intel, SDP, down a little bit. I, this is all rumors. It's all fun to speculate about, but at this point, I we've got nothing. I. I honestly, I, I'm looking at that, and when I was publishing, I'm like, I, yeah, this is fun to write about, and people are going to love reading about it, but honestly, like, what is that DDR4 running at? I'm pretty sure it wasn't one megahertz, as it was reported there. 
Well, and you know, it's... with the Infinity Fabric, like, it depends on the, the frequency of the RAM. Or, well, sorry, the, not the RAM, but the shared frequency. Well, Josh, that, that, one, come that on. one megahertz RAM could have affected those results, Jeremy. That's why there was that drop to 68,000 on that secondary test. Because they put uh, DDR, original DDR. Oh, no, that's that. SD RAM, mate. <laughs> oh okay. PC one hundred, no less. I got, yes. I got nothing, brother. Nothing. Yeah. Hey, so we have all more. Rumors we have more than just speculation. We have promises, Jeremy. We have promises. We have Lisa Sue assuring us there'll be another Threadripper, and you know, maybe by the end of the year, we'll have. It's going to have an ungodly test. amount of cores. You'd think so, because it's going to be trickle down from Epic. So why not? Why not have a sixty-four core? Home workstation 128 thread. Yeah. And all those PCIe 4.0 lines. And if yes. they started, if, it, if it's only clocked at like 2.2 gigahertz base, they could do that with like a 65 watt TDP, perhaps. Yep. I mean, it Just won't like, be 65 watt when it hits peak, but. I mean, is anything base. TDP when it hits peak? Look at the Intel Core i9-9900K, which is actually closer to 150 watts if you're pushing an all-core load on it, like Cinebench. But, you know, that's not the that's not the scenario they designed that uh, spec for, I guess. All right, well, let's, uh, let's continue on and, and uh, get through the rest of these news stories without going too long here. Uh, we've got a quick update here. Uh, Logitech today... Uh, made an announcement. This is a very popular mouse, their MX Master mouse. Mm. They updated it with the MX Master 3, but also, uh, in a surprise, uh, unveiled a companion keyboard called the MX Keys. And so you've got the, the mouse here, for those with the video version, uh, very similar to the, the existing design, a little bit changed you know, here and there. Uh, one of the features is that the scroll wheel is now uh, even faster, so you can really fly through those 1,000-page PDFs um, or the those long Mori motherboard reviews. Uh, so mm. you can just uh, scroll through real quick. And then you've got the uh, the wireless uh, keyboard here. Uh, what, do you, what do you guys think? Uh, I mean, I, I use an MX Master as like sort of my default productivity mouse. Uh, I'm not too sure about the design of this keyboard, though. I'd have to, to try. It looks like it, the Craft, doesn't it? Like the Craft um, without the, the knob. I don't, I don't think the Craft <laughs> has that uh, concave... Uh, design that doesn't. No, it doesn't. It Does it? Okay. Mm. Okay. Oh. okay. And how dare you call the MX Keys Advanced Wireless Illuminated Keyboard a knob? Good no, luck I was talking fitting about the, that on a. If if you look at the Craft keyboard from Logitech, it has a knob on the top left, and yeah, it does. I'm looking at a picture of it right here, guys. Yeah, it has no, the you're same right. Keycaps. Okay. It, if you take a craft and you chop the top off, which features the knob, then you have this. That's all I'm saying. Ah, so the Bobbit keyboard. Oh, all right. Okay. You yeah, started. yeah. So yes. there. Yeah, I guess it does. I never really used that one. Um, so I guess I wasn't. Was okay. Good, but uh, okay, not everybody remembers the craft keyboard, but I think yeah. it still exists. The, the poor man's surface dial built in. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so check out Logitech's website. Perhaps the discerning to... man's surface dial. Okay, sure, yeah. fair enough. Uh, so that, check it out uh, if you're interested in the latest uh, Logitech MX products uh, over there. That, that's the regular Logitech, and, not Logitech G. And not to interrupt you or anything, but I, the, the one thing that impressed me about these two devices was the... Uh, uh, what do they call it? Flow. Oh, so the, literally, uh, you can have uh, a Mac OS system, a Windows system, and a Linux system, and as long as you've got the driver installed on all three of them, you, you well, no, that one's scary. The mouse, you just move your pointer over to the side, just like an, any other multi-screen PC, and away you go over to the next one. Hmm. The keys let you copy and paste between systems and OSs, and I'm a little bit worried about uh, that. Th this isn't new, though. Uh, Logitech no, it's not. For a but while. I'm worried and, about and it. And there's, uh, what, is it, what is it called? Um, there's a third-party app that does this. Um, 
synergy. Does that sound familiar? Uh, sound right. There, there's a, a dedicated like non Logitech third party app that does this sort of you know Mac Linux Windows thing that, uh, from what I've heard, seems to work fairly well. Yeah, I mean, but it's not like you real sing it on the lap, on the keyboard, copy, paste, like yeah, and wireless that just well. I guess we'll get one in for a review. We'll, we'll, we'll have you uh, one sent to you. You can test it out and uh, check your comfort level. I just like the idea of that mouse scroll wheel being adjustable. Like you, it's almost like it sounds like they're getting almost haptic feedback level with the responsiveness of it and like how clicky it feels. Yeah. And yeah, it's, well, it's almost like if it's almost like if Apple made a gaming mouse, they would probably implement something like this. Hey, well, come no on, they invented parts. a mouse with two buttons. What more do you want? Apple made a gaming mouse. It's called the Apple TV Remote. Oh, God. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> so let's be careful what we wish the for. The world's worst touchpad, mm-hmm. the Apple TV Remote. Yep. No, don't, don't fast forward. Don't wire yeah, no, I, Stop. And they're like, okay, I just want to go back 10 seconds. Just go back 10 No, I paused no. it again. Back no. 10 seconds, back 10 seconds. Yeah. The, the best thing, thing you can do... Wrong. Uh, if you have once. an Apple TV, because uh, as an uh, otherwise as a hardware platform, fine. But pair Just a throw it out. remote with it, because you can you can use it with any old up down left right select remote and beautiful. But anyway, let's uh, let's finish up the news uh, here. Don't we you miss to... Betamax, Josh? <laughs> Betamax. <laughs> no. Okay. Because it only had one window in the cassette. You could only see the tape in one side. It wasn't. Yeah. No. Yeah, but when you fast forward and paused, it didn't blur. True. Oh, yes. I mean the frame hold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It was better. It was better than VHS. We all know that. It it was. No question. But it It wasn't a three hundred hertz display, though. It was not. Uh, If you want one of those, you got to go spend twenty eight hundred dollars with Acer. Uh, They've announced an update to their Predator Triton five hundred. This is a gaming fifteen inch gaming laptop they introduced at CES earlier this year, and when they launched it. It had 144 hertz IPS display, uh, G-Sync, uh, RTX mobile graphics, uh, eighth gen Intel processors. Well, they've just updated it uh, this week, and uh, they're moving to ninth gen processors and introducing a 300 hertz display with a three millisecond response time into this this laptop. Uh, so obviously, we're we're well probably well past the point of absurdity. Like, are there gamers who can tell 240 from 300 hertz? And if they are, are you gaming on a laptop? Or are you? No, they're just 16 years or younger. Well, maybe. Right. And and they're playing Fortnite, and they need Fortnite to run at 300 hertz. Obviously, I I guess. Yeah. I I I I mean, it's from a technical perspective, hitting all these milestones, and this is a record. You know, that's great. Um. Man, I don't know, and and it's it's going to be expensive. It starts at twenty seven ninety nine this December. So, yeah, uh, crank it up till it hurts. Yeah. And what's with the response time? Isn't three milliseconds a little high for a gaming monitor these days, or is it maybe they're actually giving the true response time and not just like the one shade of gray to another shade of gray uh, number? You know, perhaps because I, I think it was Acer who also just a couple months ago released that desktop display with a point four millisecond. Right, like the time. sub 0.5, yeah. Well, yeah, so I mean, in theory, what they've done is if you can actually hit 300 hertz, they've matched the refresh rate. If you can actually hit 300 <laughs> yes. hertz. So, good luck with that. Exactly. Hey, I want to play, play CS- Space Viking and friggin' Wait, StarCraft 2. CSGO, CSGO at like 640 by 480. You know, you can hit 300 frames per second. And and you can have up to... An yeah, RTX. but I threw out my CRT monitor, so I can't play it at 640 by 480 anymore. Uh, well, you could, uh, if you had Intel graphics, if you were to switch over to the... Actually, Ooh, no, you can't... You, beautiful you, segue. But it's Almost. wrong. It's wrong because you can't do it. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, anyway, so Intel... It'll look like you are. So close. Sort of. Yeah. If, if that laptop had a 10th gen Ice Lake processor... Not just any 10th gen, but the 10th gen with the G series Gen 11 graphics, they could activate integer scaling, which is what we've talked about before. Uh, NVIDIA actually introduced it in their driver back at uh, Gamescom. Intel's yep. teased this in the past. This is true 
uh, uh, it was a nearest neighbor scaling uh, yeah. to to make pixel uh, pixel art games or or retro games, which are lower resolution, look great on modern screens. And so they've got this new feature. It's a beta, and again, only for their Gen 11 graphics, which is basically nothing at this point because there's only a, a handful of systems that are, are starting to hit. But but if you do pick one up, download this beta driver, and you can enable this retro scaling uh, for for your your, your games, uh, your your retro. Uh, games they've got some examples here of, of you know kind of an effect of what it would be like with a traditional non-linear scaling uh or non-integer scaling and by integer scaling they mean scaling by whole numbers so that there's no half yeah. pixels there's no blurriness everything is a true one-to-one -one, uh scale up until the the size of your display so i know sebastian because uh, you've played with some plugins and stuff for dosbox that do yes. similar things there's a perfect pixel plugin for DOSBox. And one of the problems with DOSBox, if you've used it and experimented with all the settings it provides, is by default, it only offers up to a 3x original resolution scaling mode. So if you're in windowed mode, you can go up to 3x original resolution. But understand that a lot of these old DOS games are like 320 by 240 resolution or lower. And it wasn't until later on that we were up into like VGA and SVGA. So getting those to display on a modern monitor, it, it you get really blurry really fast as it's just, it looks kind of smeared on your screen in a way that we don't remember from the CRT days because those monitors, especially the better CRTs, were engineered to display very crisp looking graphics at various resolutions and very low resolutions. So this basically... Like that perfect pixel mod for DOSBox does a very good job of that. To be able to do it at the GPU driver level and actually have whatever's on your display, making use of integer scaling would pretty much solve any of the issues with upscaling low resolution content on that screen. I would love to see it even with like standard def content or, or lower resolution content. Then understand like if you're running a 4K monitor, Almost everything you display on that monitor is being upscaled because I don't think you're just watching native 4K content and playing games at 4K all the time. So you're very curious to see how this works with things like their sharpening plugins, like on the NVIDIA side. I haven't done any testing with this NVIDIA, with this AM, or Intel stuff yet. AMD has nothing in the way of integer scaling, by the way. The only AMD-powered computer that I know of that uses integer scaling is an iMac, like a 5K or 4K iMac, and it's because Apple has their own custom scaling engine that they use as part of their whole Retina thing. And I have seen standard DOSBox in full screen on an iMac. A recent iMac looks phenomenal because it's like pixel perfect. They're giant pixels. It's almost unwatchable to play one of these games that's like 200 by 300 on a 27-inch screen because you're looking at huge squares, but they are perfect squares. There's no softness. So I would love to see this on... But finally, on I, a, can, I can see my hitbox on the old Pixel games. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not just a, a blurry mess in the center of the yeah. screen. <laughs> I just want an uh, a Nook to come out with these Gen 11 graphics because there is no current... Uh, product on the market that all the nooks stop at eighth gen currently as far as i know and if you were to get a 10th gen i see what is it ice lake mm -hmm. nook mm -hmm. with gen 11 graphics that could become a very compelling little retro gaming station load all your gog and dos box games on there and pick whatever monitor you want and then have those crisp sort of integer scaled graphics output would it would just be phenomenal anybody who's into pixel art stuff or appreciates the almost mosaic quality to some of the choices that were made back in those days it, it you can really appreciate it when you see it on a modern display in a way that you couldn't back when you were lo looking at it on like a flickering 14 inch crt so they look yeah. pretty phenomenal yeah but i wasn't mm -hmm. jaded and cantankerous back then so i True. probably appreciated it more then yeah Capture that nostalgia, bring it back. But uh, all right, well that's that's the last news story. Uh, let's see, did uh, anybody get their picks in here? Okay, Jeremy's got one, and no, Sebastian, I do didn't. you have one? 
Okay, that's no, all right. I don't. I don't uh, Jeremy, one. start us off. You've got a pick for us here. Uh, fork political correctness. And by that, I mean fork. Everyone's favorite alternative to Photoshop is, of course, called the new image manipulation program, otherwise known as GIMP. Apparently, this is upsetting something. Yes. Uh, I don't think it was the guy from uh, that, uh, what was it, Pulp Fiction? Yeah. Release the GIMP. So they are forking Gimp sleeping. the development into Glimpse. This is part of a pick because I, I fully support the GIMP project and it is brilliant. And if that offends you or if it, you work in a place where apparently that's not safe for work and they won't pay for Photoshop, soon you'll be able to download Glimpse. Couldn't you just rename the shortcut on the desktop? Is anybody paying attention to the name of the application once it's installed? I I don't just rename think it so. Photoshop 6.0 because that's basically okay. Here's what is. happens: you, you you double click that, and it says GIMP in big oh, letters. Oh, the splash screen, the screen. splash yeah. screen, and then oh, there's a pretty, guy the new in a leather with mask the with the zippers, and the... yeah, and he's like squealing like a pig. It's it's horrifying. It, I mean, small children. It's almost as horrifying. Have nightmares. It's almost as horrifying as the last ten seconds of this podcast have been. Yeah, yeah. And you're thinking deliverance, which is a totally different manipulation program. Well, uh, I mean, the beauty of open source is that stuff like this can happen, and you can have a choice. <sighs> and if somebody wants to fork it and rename it, that that's doable so that's uh I, I hope that the people who are concerned don't feel concerned uh but also i don't want to live in this planet anymore uh, <laughs> <laughs> stop the world yeah. i want to get off yeah all right josh uh, what's your pick this is going to be shocking <clears throat> uh -oh. actually this is the usb version with 7.1 sound of the easy smx the same headset except it's got the, the full USB audio and power. <clears throat> Otherwise, identical and only 27, 28 bucks. I mean, you can throw these things across the room. They still work perfectly fine and look great. Same functionality, but it's it's USB and not uh, it's not analog. So it's it's got all the all the goodness going on inside there. Look at that price. Twenty-seven ninety-nine on Amazon bucks, right now. Yeah. Really, that's nuts. Not for long. So if you want one, get it quick. I don't know how long it's going to be at that price. All right, and then real quick, uh, my pick is uh, something uh, not technical. Uh, uh, hopefully, you all know about leave-in thermometers that has become part of your cooking for the oven or the grill because it just changes everything. You don't have to guess. You can perfectly get what? those, you know, get those those steaks or those that chicken, whatever, get it to the perfect temperature without guessing. And I've been using a little one that's just a, a wire that connects to a timer box that sits outside the oven or the or the grill. But the problem is you got to like be right there to hear it when it hits the, the designated temperature. And so to solve that, there's a whole bunch of these leave-in thermometers that uh, are, are Bluetooth enabled or, or otherwise smart Wi-Fi so that you can get it on your smartphone. And a ton of them are expensive and a lot of them don't get very good reviews. Well, I found one and I've been using one that is pretty cheap and gets pretty good reviews. It's the Smarto, or I'm sorry, Smartro ST55 wireless digital meat thermometer. And so it's it's this little uh, this little box here that uh, does the, it's very simple. It, it you, set, you set a target temperature and then it gives you the temperature of up to three probes that you can use, uh, thermometer probes. Stick it into your meat or whatever you're trying to measure in the oven or grill, and then sync it to your, your smartphone. And uh, there's, there's a little app, and it's a very, again, very simple app. But all it does is say, it lets you know if you're like, for me, for example, I'm downstairs uh, working. It lets me know that the steaks are ready to get pulled out and, and reverse seared. So I don't have to sit up in the kitchen and wait for it. So it's it's uh, $39.99 at Amazon. Yeah. And um, pretty good. Don't 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 put it in your urethra. Yeah, it okay. looks painful. Yeah. And no, it in your meat is. You is said leave in not. thermometer and yeah. Yeah. Okay. We weren't uh, sure where one. you were going with this. Like, you know, I, I know it's it's a favored way of taking temperatures in certain animals. I mean, and I, maybe 
different stages of life. But it's awful pointy for. I, for I the, walked. You know, I walked yeah. right in to that. I'll admit, but my God, I wasn't even. <laughs> I was you know the best thing six. is you can get two of your other friends and you could all never mind compare so, temperatures. I, I thought this was gonna hey, like become a story like hey, 20, 20. So, you know I I've been okay, ill I recently and and I yeah. I've had to take my temperature a lot and it gets old. So I take it out, put it back in. Is this the one that goes in my mouth? Is this the one that goes? down uh, there and so just it, put it in and leave it in and i can just pick yeah, up my so, phone and say oh i am 98.6 right now i'm still good uh some helms asshole in has my chat, pen uh helms in the discord <laughs> chat said this is why jim got sick yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you All finally right. like oh you know oh. what doctor um i do have this leave-in thermometer in right now mm-hmm. a wrong uh, side sebastian oh okay and I'm, I'm now worried that I didn't pronounce it right. Is it Jimp or Gimp? I've always said, I've always said Jimp because <laughs> I don't need that. I don't need. They could just re, they could rename it with a J. That's fine. <laughs> I've always. I, I don't say Jif. I say Gif because it's Gif. Mm-hmm. Because you're GIF right. A, because Jif is a peanut butter, but you it know, is. well, it's a lousy peanut butter. Yes, except for the peanut on top. I like the extra crunchy Jif natural just fine, but even that isn't just real peanut butter. It has other stuff in it, like sugar and stuff in it. But. You know, the worst thing is when you want to be healthy and you go buy the all natural peanut butter. Oh, I know. And you're just oh, stirring dirt, and, and you're just stirring it's just this vaguely peanut flavored <laughs> dirt in a jar. And, but uh, there's oil in there, maybe if you can get to it through the yeah. layer of concrete at the top. But then once you, you do stir it up, it. once you do stir it up, it's an oily mess that just never goes away. Mm-hmm. And so you put it in the fridge, and then it becomes concrete again. Uh, peanut yeah, oil really. is the best oil. You know, All right, well, fry thanks. Anything Which peanut oil so is the it. way to go. Uh, thanks Remember when chips were fried us. in peanut oil? Let's, let's just wrap Hi. this up. We're just going to wrap it up real quick. And uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we do this Wednesday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern. And uh, we uh, hope you'll join us at pcpro.com slash live, pcpro.com slash subscribe if you want to be notified when we go live. And uh, check out pcpro.com, obviously, for all of the uh, the stories and articles. And, oh, I didn't check Patreon. Hang on one second. Oh, no. Uh, oh, we did. We got a, we got a new uh, an increased pledge. Uh, Paul Brarin of tinkertry.com. Oh, Paul, and, oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Hey, uh, Paul. I, Thanks. I'm not, uh, let's see, tinkertry.com. Hopefully this is safe for work. He does a lot of uh, enterprise stuff. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, he does. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate that. And uh, check out tinkertry, that's T-I-N-K-E-R-T-R-Y.com for enterprise. It looks like enterprise news and reviews. and. Yeah, yep. he does a lot of VMware and enterprise hardware. It's good stuff, Maynard. Yep. Perfect. I'm glad I didn't forget that. Uh, So thank you, Paul. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.